talk to programmers, game designers, and independents to discover the future of gaming. And we review WWF SmackDown. The latest installment in the recent barrage of wrestling titles gives new life to the genre. Plus, we show up the latest hack and slash for the Dreamcast. Stick around. It's game time. Hello and welcome to another edition of GameSpot TV. I'm Adam Sessler. Now, the Game Developers Conference, formerly known as the Computer Game Developers Conference until recently, is the premier gathering place for those technical and creative minds behind the games we play. Now, the name was changed to reflect the increasing presence of console games at the conference. And as we'll see, that was definitely the case this year. With all the hype from game publishers and the rabid interest of gamers themselves, it's sometimes possible to forget about the people who actually make the games. And so we're here in San Jose, California, for the Game Developers Conference to remind ourselves that without these people, we'd still be playing checkers. This is the 14th annual Game Developers Conference, and it started with actually a couple of individuals in their living room, and now has grown to over 10,000 international attendees. It's the place where games start. The developers come here to exchange ideas and create the next generation of games. We're definitely seeing the industry mature. It has become an $11 billion industry, and so as gaming becomes more popular and more mainstream entertainment, we certainly see more and more developers in this community. I remember the CGDC many, many years ago, where it was like just a little auditorium, and this is like a little different. The very exciting thing about the lectures and the roundtables at the Game Developers Conference is that it is defined by the developers themselves and presented by the developers themselves. So it's very much a peer-driven uh, agenda. I wouldn't trade the opportunity of coming to the GDC for anything. To some extent, I actually prefer it to the game to uh, E3 because E3 has, is so huge and there's so many people that you can. I mean, often you can't find people that you know if you want to network, talk, uh, talk about game design, go out and party, have a good time with them. And I mean, that's what GDC seems to be a lot about. It's about the community. It's about you you know, everybody sharing knowledge and showing off stuff and having a good time. Well, the GDC does provide an opportunity for game developers to discuss programming and game design. It's also a place to see the latest in software and hardware technology. It gives the developers a sense of what they're developing for. One of the things is recruiting, you know, but I mean, we really want to show exactly what we're all about, which is game. game, game. Here we go! Let's go! We're showing all the latest stuff, um, third party and first party. But you know, we're, we're basically here for the developers. We want to get people interested in the machine. Well, this is a, a conference. Is you know the premier conference for the development community, and we as developers are here. Uh, we're here working with our developers. We're here attending a lot of the technical sessions. There's a tremendous amount of valuable information here. It's more uh, a conference for us in which we are participating and garnering information, and working with our key partners in the development community. I'd say the GDC has changed uh, tenfold since. Uh, I think uh, it was about 94, 95 when Miller Freeman actually wound up purchasing. Uh, I don't know if it was the rights or, or whatever to the GDC. Uh, things have become a lot more commercial. It's really exploded into almost like a mini E3. It, it's really getting crazy. But it's, you know, I go here to network with people and to show off our new technology and to maybe, you know, share my information about things that I happen to work on or to learn something from somebody else. And this wouldn't be the GDC 2000 without somebody taking advantage of all the media attention and making a big announcement. And as you probably know, this wasn't just somebody. I'm announcing the Xbox, uh, which we're modestly titling. Uh, <laughs> the, the modest tagline here is, is the future of console gaming. Uh, and so this is a device for the living room. Uh, it's a device uh, that'll come out in fall 2001. Well, I think it really goes to the core of what we're trying to do with Xbox. We wanted to make a platform that was designed by game developers for game developers. And so what better place than to deliver it to the home of game developers at GDC? You know, we had Bill G up out there, Mr. Gates, and he was up talking to all the game developers. And uh, 
you know, it's it's a platform that's so developer friendly. That's what we wanted to create. You know, the longer you are in this industry and the longer you wind up knowing people and everything, I mean, you really start feeling like a real sense of community and almost family. It's kind of eerie. There's so many people and there's so many wacky personalities that it, it kind of grows on you. It's almost infectious. Now do not fear, there will be more on the Xbox later on in the show. And come check out our extended coverage of the Game Developers Conference by coming to the GameSpot TV website. There you can check out our Spotlight feature on the GDC in streaming video. And enjoy full interviews with more game developers and should be legally allowed in one conference hall. Coming up on GameSpot TV, we preview the latest hack and slash for the Dreamcast. This game is not for those with weak stomachs. And we have a cheat code for Lunar Silver Star Story that unlocks a whole new kind of game. Welcome back. Now our first preview is a game based upon the popular manga from Japan called Berserker by Kentaro Miura. The developer is Yukes, who's responsible for WWF Smackdown. So the result, as you may imagine, is pretty but pretty gruesome as well. Many of the Final Fight-inspired 3D games brings to mind the tedious experience of fighting force and zombie revenge, but it would seem that disappointed fans of the genre may have a winner on their hands. Controls in this game are pretty simple to figure out. You can jump, block, and swing one mighty-looking piece of blacksmith ingenuity. At its heart, the game is just a straightforward hack and slash, where you just rely on your basest of instincts. Chop the enemy to bits and pieces, and try not to have the same thing happen to yourself. The game also will provide you with an endless array of things to chop up, with soldiers, undead creatures, monsters, and many a mutated thingamajig. The berserk mentioned in the title is a condition that comes over Gatsu when he has incurred enough damage. Suddenly, the screen turns blood red, and everybody regrets picking a fight with this guy. One of the best elements in the game is the sound, especially the sword cutting through the air. If you have a subwoofer, you're going to feel it in your chest. Voice work in the game should bring back some memories of Eidos's Soul Reaver through the numerous cutscenes found in the game. Now hurry and squash them! Needless to say, the graphics look really good. And while not a deep game, Sword of the Berserk Guts Rage might provide one of those satisfying, mindless experiences. We'll tell when it's released. It should be terribly reassuring to all of us that Eidos has promised that they've increased the gore factor for Sword of the Berserk by 30% over the Japanese version simply titled Berserk. Now this next game is for all those fans of Homer, the poet. This next game uses quite a few gods and heroes from Greek and Roman mythology, which would make it sound quite promising, but unfortunately, it didn't deliver quite as we would have liked. The mythology that interplays in Viticus wraps itself in is rich in potential, combining role-playing elements into a real-time strategy vehicle based on the universe of Greek and Roman gods and goddesses. And in Viticus, game players assume the role of a not-so-lucky human who's cast as the primary in a wager between Athena and a vengeful Poseidon, the gist of which is to impress Poseidon enough so as to prevent him from drowning the whole of civilization. To accomplish the task at hand, you're allowed to recruit two famous heroes from the text of ancient mythos. These two combined with ones you meet along your quest and the more regular variety of men for hire will form the basis of your fearless army in a series of single player events with additional multiplayer matchups available through M Player. But where one battle might be against a clock and another against those who would keep you from a person or a much sought after item, unfortunately, some of Inviticus's largest battles are against boredom. Poorly executed. Steve Poole of GameSpot gives Interplay's Epic Inviticus a 4.7 out of 10. All right, perhaps we were a little harsh, but if you want a good strategy game, you cannot go wrong with Age of Empires 2, The Age of Kings. And if you're an RPG fan, you might have been playing Lunar Silver Star Story Complete, and you might find that you need a break from the very heavy narrative. So here's a new way to have quite a bit of fun with your favorite characters. 
The PlayStation version of Lunar Silver Star Story Complete has been regarded as one of the coolest anime-style RPGs ever featured on a console. But did you know that Lunar also makes for a great retro arcade game? Go ahead and pop in your making of Lunar CD, and as the video starts, press up, down, left, right, triangle, start. Then you'll be thrown into the maelstrom that is Lords of Lunar. Here you get to play a game that looks like the love child of Pong and Breakout as you try to defend your castle from bouncing balls. If you didn't get that cheat down fast enough, come on over to the Game Help section of the GameSpot TV website where you can get your own Lunar Silver Star Story Complete Cheat, as well as more strategy guides that you can shake a joystick at. Coming up on GameSpot TV, John McClane is back to clean up Sin City. Die Hard Trilogy 2 has hit the shelves, and we have a review. And get ready for it. We have more wrestling action in our review of WWF SmackDown. If you're a fan of the WWF, you better recognize. Welcome back. Now, if you're a fan of Bruce Willis or the Die Hard films, or you enjoyed the first game in the Die Hard trilogy series, you may think to rush out and buy the newest installment for the game. But we suggest you wait until you see our review. Considering all the excitement inherent in the Bruce Willis-driven Die Hard movies, it's no wonder that licensing monster Fox Interactive will be looking to cash in a second time with their latest endeavor, Die Hard Trilogy 2. Like the original Die Hard Trilogy, number two scatters its energies combining three different types of games into one, with varying degrees of success. Familiar enough are the third-person levels, where players pilot John McClane through various objective-based missions. Similarly, the gun game levels, where players are invited to use an optional light gun peripheral to blast their way through the overwhelming odds, retains a likable enough charm. But the driving levels, where players are asked to drive around ramming pesky terrorists, for example, fall somewhat short in the thrills department. Differing from its predecessor, however, Die Hard Trilogy 2 lets players sample the three different types of gameplay individually with a new arcade mode or let you experience them in their linear progression with the movie mode. Yippee-ki-yay. 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 In all, light gun owners may want to give it a whirl, but Die Hard Trilogy 2 may perhaps prove a better rental than a purchase. Videogames.com's Joe Fielder gives it a 6.3 out of 10. Now, if you haven't tried out the original Die Hard trilogy, I highly recommend it. It might be a little dated by today's standards, but it definitely is an exceptional game and a classic. Now, Messiah is one of those games that always seems to be about to be released, but it looks like developer Shiny is actually on the verge of giving us its finished product. And here's a look. The idea behind Messiah is an inventive one. You play a cherub named Bob who has been sent to a despairing post-apocalyptic world to prevent the arrival of something really bad. While Bob himself is not the most sturdy of warriors, he does have the capability to possess any character you encounter in the game. While not limitless, this gameplay device opens up many options in the game. You need to take into account who Bob is possessing and how welcome they will be in certain environments. So sometimes characters should be chosen for their stealth benefits, and other times you just want the burliest gun toter and open fire on everything. The game uses a new engine called the Real-Time Deformation and Tessellation Engine, which will measure a computer's processor capabilities at the beginning of each level, and then reduce or increase polygon counts in visible characters to maintain a constant frame rate in the game. With the amount of hype following the game for its two and a half years, developer Shiny has a lot to prove, but it looks like we can all find out if it is the second coming very soon. Hey there, little fella. Now, the quirky sense of humor in the game definitely seems to have come from the minds that made their most famous title, Earthworm Jim. Now, it always seems that when you turn around, there's another wrestling game on the shelves. WWF, WCW, ECW. Well, if you're only planning on buying one wrestling game this year, this is the game for you. Wrestling shows are some of the highest-rated programs on television today. 
game company, THQ is looking to parlay some of that popularity into the video game arena with their latest endeavor, WWF SmackDown. Many of your favorite wrestlers are represented. Mankind, Triple H, China, and The Rock, to name a few. But game players will also have a chance to create a wrestler, and it's significant to note that hidden wrestlers uncovered in the season mode will show up as usable parts in the assembly. Once in the ring, SmackDown allows for all the familiar showdowns. Exhibition, King of the Ring, three and four way tangling, and a lengthy season option, which may be one of the best career modes ever in a wrestling game. Add to this mix a couple of pin anywhere matches, which encourages wrestlers to get the job done in a variety of out of the ring locations, plus an opportunity to referee, and you have more choices available than Mankind has headlocks. Setting THQ's new title apart from the other previous wrestling game ventures is SmackDown's noticeably speedier gameplay. The improved reaction times lend urgency to the proceedings that other titles have been unable to encompass. Ooh, that's gotta hurt. The rock solid gameplay, fast animations, and attention to details makes THQ's WWF SmackDown a worthy contender for the game belt in 2000. Nicely done. Videogames.com's Jeff Gertzman gives SmackDown for the PlayStation an 8.7 out of 10. Well, if you don't agree with our WWF SmackDown review, then slam a message on the GameSpot TV message board at the GameSpot TV website. And while you're there, check out our preview of Messiah and a review of Die Hard Trilogy again in streaming video. Coming up on GameSpot TV, we have more from behind the scenes at the Game Developers Conference, including Microsoft's mysteriously shrouded new gaming machine, the Xbox. Well, as we all know, the PlayStation 2 has already been released in Japan, and it will be arriving on our shores sometime in the fall. But until then, here's a look at what's to come. This is the intro for Ridge Racer 5 for the PlayStation 2. You're tuned to 76.5 on your FM dial. This is R-I-D-G-E FM, broadcasting live from Ridge City. This is for all you race fans out there. Here are the Boom Boom satellites coming straight at you with some wicked beats. Check it out now. As we mentioned earlier, the Xbox was announced at this year's Game Developers Conference. But some of you may ask, what exactly is an Xbox? So to answer that, here's a look at the newest entry in the console gaming arena. Rumors that Microsoft was developing a console system swirled around the gaming world for months. Insiders speculated on if and when an official announcement would come. When Microsoft Chairman Bill Gates took the stage to deliver the keynote address at the Game Developers Conference, the time was right and the rumors became reality. So I'm announcing the Xbox, uh, which we're modestly titling. Uh... Okay, so Gates has made it official and it is called the Xbox. But in a world with Sega, Nintendo and the Sony PlayStation, what's going to make this machine stand out? Its impressive hardware specifications definitely place it in a league of its own. The customized central processing unit will be a minimum 600 megahertz customized Pentium 3 technology. That's twice as fast as the PlayStation 2. The graphics processor, or the X chip, will be developed by Microsoft and NVIDIA. It will be 300 megahertz and... This graphics processor can do one trillion operations a second. Most significant is that unlike any other console system, the Xbox will also include an 8 gigabyte hard drive. And that's something that I personally fought really hard for because you've got this incredibly powerful graphics processor, but you've got to support it by getting data behind it. 
you gotta be able to turn around, you gotta be able to look backwards, you gotta be able to run through this alley and into some new place. And as, as the graphics capabilities come up, that's meant more memory, more memory. You've got to have a way to get that data in very quickly. Having the hardness there to support that is what's really going to make this, I think, really going to make the platform special. With this hardware and Windows-based operating system, it's understandable that one might perceive the Xbox to be a powerful PC game machine hooked up to their television. But Microsoft is adamant that this is a console gaming platform. We're really focused on that core console gaming market, that core console gamer. And really, they're a different audience than the PC audience. I think you're, what you're going to see is a lot of very original content for this platform that's really focused on you know, that gamer, uh, console gamer. I was very surprised by the Xbox. Uh, I was expecting it to be kind of cool, kind of like a, a stripped-down PC. Um, but what I wound up seeing very much excited me. Everything looks really smooth. It looks really sharp. Now, there's little question that the Xbox will be a very impressive machine, but there's already three console companies fighting for the gaming dollar. So the question is, if you add a fourth, will they all survive? There's only room for first place and second place, and that's about it. And uh, it's going to start getting real scary. Uh, if anybody can pull the collective rug out from Sony's basic ownership of the industry, it's Microsoft. But Nintendo, I would not underestimate Shigeru Miyamoto and the design talent. They have Pokemon, they, cre they create absolute phenomenons. I wouldn't underestimate them. And Sega's got some really good guys in their camp. They have uh, Shenmue and Yu Suzuki and a lot of those great titles, and they're actually going ahead with their online strategy. So it's going to be really interesting, and uh, the ones who win are the, the customers and the developers in the end. If you want to find out more about the Xbox and the Game Developers Conference, come on down to the GameSpot TV website and watch both our GDC spotlights and streaming video. And while you're there, read up and learn more on all the next generation console systems, from the Xbox to the PS2 and the Nintendo Project Dolphin. And come to our chat at 8 p.m. Tuesdays Eastern Time and discuss what you think will be the winner in the console wars. So until next week, bye-bye.